got a treat today. We have two uh, individuals who are just so versed in every aspect of early childhood and childhood education. I want to begin by introducing you to Dr. Parcell. She is a very good friend of mine. She's actually my I say that? Yeah, she was my teacher when I first came to Weatherford College. And then um, I took over her job when she told me she was going to retire and I had to. <clears throat> so uh, that's kind of the way that went. But Dr. Parcells has been in uh, early childhood for over 30 years. She's been in various related early childhood and, ed or, and education positions. Um, these include training children and community organizations, serving as a kindergarten teacher, which is probably one of your first times. It was. It was. And department chair here of early childhood, of childhood development at Weatherford College. Uh, while she was an associate professor and extension specialist for Texas Agriculture Life Extension, Jean traveled the state for four years, providing training for early childhood educators and child care providers. She held management positions in two large Head Start and Early Head Start programs and is a certified family life educator. Um, Dr. Possell serves as the agent professor in early childhood family development for the American Public University, and she currently works as an independent contractor. And, uh, and I have 10 grandchildren. Yes, she does. And I'm uh, a federal reviewer for the Head Start Early Head Start program grants. Um, and I also want to introduce you to Dr. Sell. Dr. Sell has been one of my idols for a very, very long time. Um, he just found that out today. Yeah. Uh, no, I have a picture of it. I'm uh, sorry. I'm a groupie. No, not really. Uh, Dr. Possell, Dr. Possell, Dr. Sell has, uh, was started at Tarleton as a child and family life studies in the uh, human science department as a uh, professor there and was also department interim department chair. He hated that, yes. but that's okay. He did that. Um, and then he was also part of Texas, the Texas Agriculture Life um, Extension Program. He is retired and loving that uh, and loves traveling. So um, they have been in early childhood together for probably over 20 years. To, oh, together? And combined? Combined. Oh, that's too big. That goes into oh, three dishes. Okay, never mind. For a very long time. So We're not that old. <laughs> so you're going to get a wealth of information about early childhood, uh, why it's important, and um, what we can do to assist teachers in that respect, and why it's important to us as uh, college professors, why early childhood makes a difference when students enter college. So, no further ado, I will throw it back to you again. Good morning. Good morning. morning. How's everybody? It's cold. My daughter lives in Alaska, so when I call her and say, it's cold, she goes, <laughs> it's minus 22 here, Mom. Um, what do you think of when you hear the words child care, early childhood, child development? What are some of the things that come to mind? Money. Money? <laughs> Earning it or spending it? Spending it. What else? So if you're thinking about earning money. Yeah, we were going to tell you the wrong field. <laughs> what else? What do you think about? Their development, getting them on the right track. Getting kind them of the like right a foundation track. for their mm -hmm. I love that word, foundation. When you just hear the words child care, what do you think about? Stress. <laughs> <laughs> Stress. Stress. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, Nick and I are here to talk about early childhood education, why it's important, but more than that, what it does. Because I cannot tell you, and these people will back me up how many times people have said, it must be so much fun to play with the babies all day. <laughs> and it is, sort of, sometimes. But the point is, people who are doing quality childcare, and I have to really stress that, are not just babysitting. They are teaching children. These kids are learning. And I've had a lot of parents, I'm sure you have too, say, I want my child to learn not just play all day. <laughs> We've got to talk about that. Um, early childhood is the only education in America that it's not um, underfunded by somebody else. Parents face the full funding, except for the few government programs. And most parents of young children are at the lowest salaries of their life, because they're just starting. Um, it costs as much to send a child to a good quality childcare as it does go to college. And it's um, it's a difficult it's a difficult situation. But I want you to go ahead. You had some questions you wanted to ask them too. Oh, I'd, I'd just be interested. First of all, I'd be interested. How many of you are going to think this might be a career choice for you? 
either child care or something working with children. Nobody? You're here because you're taking an algebra course? Why are you here? I mean, you got this. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not going to sign your <laughs> From whom? I mean, seriously, how many of you here are here who are studying some kind of education or early childhood or something? Well, that's really interesting. I'm actually kind of glad. Yeah. Because this will be new information for all of you. Yeah, and many of you may have to put in a job here. I do a geriatric well, there, oh, I mean, you're laughing, but there's a lot of similarities between early childhood and old age. My mother's 98, and whereas we don't, thankfully, have to care for her like that, she's in really good shape, but her memory is short, and we have to kind of operate in the same way that you operate with younger children. Um, yeah, that's so, a really interesting thing, because if you watch someone in the very old, very old is nice. older than us. Yeah, a lot older than us. <laughs> if you watch them walk, they watch they walk like a toddler. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, kind of, and they're being wheeled like yeah. a stroller, except it's a wheelchair. You have to encourage them to eat and eat properly. My mother will eat truly ice cream all day, all night. But getting her to eat some protein that she really needs is tough. So they're they're actually developmentally are a lot of of things that are similar. Hmm? We often do. Yeah, motor skills become difficult. So there, there are a lot of similarities. The big difference, of course, psychologically being you expect the children to grow out of it and you know that the elderly are not going to. So, so there's some things as caregivers, which is, this is just a side part. All of you part of the sandwich generation where people my age are caring for their parents and their children. Well, actually, I'm now in the club sandwich generation because I'm caring for my parents, helping my children when they need it, sometimes caring for grandchildren. I have a great granddaughter, so I'm not sure about that other layer. Oh, I'm no. really <laughs> sick. The dessert. The, dessert. <laughs> the great granddaughter, yeah, she's dessert. So, everybody, I've yet to find somebody that didn't have a child in their life in some way. Your own child, a friend, somebody at church, the neighbor's kid. Generally speaking, most of us interact with children. Quality child care makes a huge difference in children's lives. Quality child care is hard to find. Am I wrong? No. Okay. Well, I had a little slideshow, but you know, we couldn't put the computer up. So, what I want to talk about just briefly, and really what I want is questions from you all, especially since you're not in this field. I would like to know what you'd like to know, because we feel like it's a golden opportunity to explain to people why we, I mean, we've spent our whole career working with children. Why? You know, is there, did you have a question? Oh, don't raise your hand around like that. I'll call on you. It's like an auction if you move. Yeah, yeah, then you're up. Um, so, how many of y'all know anything about the brain research that's gone on in the last 20 years? Brain research? It's probably longer than that. Uh, probably 30 years ago when Time and Newsweek and U.S. News and World Report, all three of the major news magazines in the same week had a picture of a baby on the front. That never happened before. And the reason it was so important was because y'all are all too young to know that there was a time when we didn't have MRIs. We didn't have CAT scans. We couldn't look at the brain. But that's when they started being able to image what was going on in the brain and, oh, children learn a lot in their first few years. We have pictures that show it now, like we didn't know. So in the early years, there's three quarters of the brain develops after birth. Um, neurons <coughs> are present in, in billions. But the systems for, their neuro, for the neurons aren't in place yet. That's what happens in early childhood. They connect and they form the basis for our thinking. What also happens in early childhood is they prune off. You don't, how many do you have as an adult? A whole lot fewer. We, um, the synapses increase to about a thousand trillion, and then about half of that or more is pruned off because you don't use it. Every child is born able to learn any language. Okay? Just because you look Chinese doesn't mean you have to speak Chinese. I have a Chinese adopted daughter. Um, but when we don't use those neurons and don't make those synapses connections, we prune them off because we don't need them. Which tells us 
that everything we're learning in early childhood, there's a certain amount of time to get some of that in. Mm -hmm. They think that language ends about the age of 10. When do we teach foreign language in America? High school. High school. We don't understand. No. Yeah, that's, that's why you can never use it. No, that's why you can't speak it. Whereas when you're younger, you still have all those neurons and the synapses can be connected. That's why little children who are bilingual are, I can't tell you how many five-year-old interpreters I've had when I worked with Head Start. Mama couldn't speak English and I couldn't speak Spanish, but the five-year-old got them both and they would interpret. Because when we're very young, our brain is wired for that. It doesn't mean we can't learn a language later, it's just a lot harder and you probably won't ever sound like a native speaker. I speak a little bit of Spanish, but I never do it around my Spanish-speaking friends because they laugh at my accent. <laughs> That's my feelings. Yeah, we, were, we were in uh, French-speaking Canada in December, so when we walk in a store like you're supposed to do in Paris, I'd go, bonjour, and they'd say, welcome, glad to see you. <laughs> you know, I could say bonjour, but I couldn't say it like that. <laughs> Children's brains are operating twice as fast as adult brains. It's sort of like building versus remodeling. If you, anybody ever had a kitchen remodel? It's the worst, it's the worst, because nothing ever fits right. But when you build from scratch, it may take a while, but you don't have all those kinds of problems. And that's, not, that's the same way it is for brain development. If we start early and do what we need to do for young children, then we've got that brain development going that lasts throughout life. Let's see if I can. Get another picture here to remind me of what I wanted to say. So, what I really want to talk about, any of you been in a child care place lately? Do they have different centers set up? Here's an area where they play block with blocks, and here's, I want to talk to you about what some of those things do. I would tell people if they're going to open a child care center and can only afford a little bit, buy books and blocks. And lots and lots of blocks. Actually, Head Start recommends 750 unit blocks per classroom. The reason for that is unit blocks, anybody know what they are? What? Aren't they the ones with the shapes? You can make shapes with them or the. You can. Or the, right. they have like different colored ones so you can connect them. Different Not usually, but, but they do have different shapes, but they're all connected mathematically. The first unit is a rectangle, and everything else fits with that mathematically. The longer one is twice this size. The triangles fit perfectly on it. Everything relates mathematically to the first unit block. Therefore, everything they're doing with a block, with unit blocks, is about math. It's about ratio and size and proportion. They also learn science with blocks. How tall can you build that building? Could you build it taller if you had a bigger base? Um, they learn cooperation. Don't come knock down my tower. You know, if we work together, we can build a bigger tower. So blocks are a really, really <coughs> incredible part of what's being called stream. Science, technology, engineering, art, math. Tell me about something? Oh, steam. 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 Well, stream, the reading. Stream is the science, technology, reading, reading. Art. reading. So another thing is if you give children something, we recommend that every center and every child care facility has writing implements. Mm -hmm. If you have blocks and you give them paper and pencil, they will draw maps. They will build roads. They'll draw buildings and try to recreate it. If we give them what they need, they'll use it. Um, child directed play is where they learn the most, but that does not mean a teacher just says, go play. <laughs> it's set up, it's encouraged, it's, there's a lesson plan. You know what you hope they're gonna learn from that. You're in there. Teachers in early childhood don't have a desk, <coughs> you're not supposed to be sitting at a desk. You're supposed to be playing with the children and helping them as they gain these skills. So blocks are really important to engineering and technology and math. Um, what do they learn? Uh, forms in space, how various shapes and sizes work together, math concepts, and language and literacy, because they start, the older kids start working together. If you'll build the hospital over here, I'll build the city park. And so they start learning to communicate and negotiate. If you don't have 750 blocks, and most people don't, then there's only three of those big long ones, and I need two of them 
and you want three of them, how are we going to do that? How are we going to work that out? So negotiation and compromise comes into play. Um, art. Tell me what you think when I say art for early childhood. Yes, I'm finger painting. Finger painting. Finger painting. Oh, that's good. I like that. It's very textile, very sensory. Um, it's an excellent learning thing for young children. Some kids who have sensory issues will have trouble with that. And they'll do this. Or Play Doh. Play Doh. You can make your own Play Doh. It's cheaper. And my wife, she's a full time stay at home mom. Mm -hmm. She's my daughter. She takes like beans and put little shapes in there. And yeah. All things and she has oh, a sensory that. table. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Same. Yeah. Stay at home mom actually was my favorite job that I've ever had. I got to do it for 15 years. It was fabulous. Um, art, listen carefully to this one sentence. Crafts are not art. Crafts are not art. When they bring home the pumpkin at Christmas that has the googly eyes, that's a craft. It's not art. There's nothing wrong with crafts. You can teach children how to cut on the line, you can teach them how to follow directions, but it's not art. Art is what children do on their own, without prompts from teachers, without, they, you have to give them the materials, but crafts where they have to make every, if you walk into a classroom and everything on the wall is the same, find another center. <laughs> and if you go in and the easel is clean, leave. I don't trust people with clean easels. <laughs> Kids aren't painting. You know, and painting on an easel teaches this kind of movement for fine motor skill. It's not the same as this. So clean easels, no, not good. I read an article last night, as a matter of fact, about how art activities increase language and literacy and compassion. They start seeing what other people have drawn or painted, and it makes sense to them. Oh, you're split. So they learn to interact. Tina, I've also heard of people Thing. Here's what we're going to make today. Oh, yeah. And that just throws the children because like, I can't make it like my teacher. Made. Right, right. Yeah. I wish I had actually brought the little experiment we do really often. Divide the group into three, and we're going to make a Valentine's card for your mom. So the people over here have just enough materials to make it just like mine. The people in the middle have a few extra materials. And the people over here have a ton of materials. Beads and in sequins, and you'd be amazed how many adult people go, ooh, stickers, and they like stickers. <laughs> so when you're giving instructions to each group, you say to this group, here's what we're going to make for mom. Here's the Valentine's card. You hold it up, you say, make it just like this. And they will. They're not happy about it. They'll do it. Tell these people, I want you to make a Valentine's card for your mom. Here's the one I made. You don't have to make it like me. But here's the one I made. Inevitably, at the very least, everybody in that group will open the card the same way yours did. They won't think to open it this way. Even if they do a few different things, they will always open it the same way you did. You get over here and you just say, make the Valentine's card for your mom. And these people, you can't shut up. You're, these people are bored. They've got their phones out. They're, you know, they're finished. Um, these people might still be working a little bit, and these people work through the rest of the workshop because it's theirs. It belongs to them. I've had a child refuse to take something home um, in a class that I was observing. He said, I didn't make that. The teacher made it. Well, she didn't make it, but, you know, it was ours. He wouldn't take it home. So art is incredibly important to young children to express. Uh, art therapists learn a lot about kids and help a lot from watching what children have drawn. Dick, I'm not meaning to just run over you and talk whenever. I'm about to be finished, though. It's coming to your turn. <laughs> this was originally a panel discussion, so our panel shrunk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, uh, That's why we kind of go back to court. We had about five people yeah. originally, so. Sand and water play are like you were talking about, filled with beans. Things that children can fill and dump. What would they be learning from that? And diet coordination? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely fine motor skills. What about uh, volume? What about prediction? You've got a one cup container that's this tall and a one cup container that's this tall but wider around. Are they going to learn something from that? Oh, the same amount fits in those. So they're learning math, they're learning science, learning physics. And people who don't understand this are just looking at them going, well, they're just playing in water or beans or whatever. 
and they're actually learning many, many math and science concepts and sensory. You can tell a child who might have a sensory issue if they don't want to get their hands all the way down in that, even though it's not messy, the, the feel of it may bother them. So that's kind of a red flag. That's the other thing we do in early childhood. We watch, we observe to see if there are things we need to pass on to the experts. It's sand and water play, plus they really like it. They really like water play. We have a water table in our backyard because my husband's a wonderful, generous man, and when I say, oh, we need this for the kid, he will build it. So we have a water table, and they want to go out when it's freezing. I have to say, no, I'm sorry, we can't do the water table today, but that's where they want to go. Even the one who just turned nine is still pretty interested in the water table. Um, kids are drip dry. This is very important to remember. When you have a child care facility like you did, didn't people bring their little girls all dressed up in bows in their hair, socks, fully socks, and yeah. cute little sandals. We're going to get dirty. We're going to get dirty. Don't, don't wear clothes like that. Say clothes <coughs> or whatever else. We are going to do messy things because they learn from them. You used to have a little girl. Her mother would always send her and design her clothes. And she would, like eating spaghetti or something, and she, she wouldn't use a napkin, she'd rub it on her collar. <laughs> I just always thought that was so funny. <laughs> we do try to teach the manners, we do try to teach the manners. Um, what's a center, maybe, that you've seen? I don't mean a, a facility, I mean a center within the classroom where they're playing. That you've seen that you think, well, that's just, that's just wasting time. Seen any of those? What? Which one? <laughs> oh, but I'm not talking about the whole center. I'm talking about within the classrooms. I have never been in there. So I'm really about them. Like, are you thinking the little kitchen? Ah, uh, dramatic play. Oh, yeah. Dramatic play is incredibly important, but it doesn't always have to be a kitchen. It started out as a kitchen mostly because. Moms all stayed home. Kids knew the kitchen. That's where they were. So you could put in familiar things that adults did, and they would copy them. Most mommies don't get to be home these days. I've seen one of the best dramatic play centers I ever saw was a shoe store. And they had brought in, parents had brought shoes, and somebody found one of those little metal measuring things, you know, so they could oh, like, oh, store. Then <laughs> the kids could measure their feet, and they had them in boxes. And they put a cash register in there and some paper, and the kids were selling shoes. Well, here, measure your foot, and then I'll get you a shoe that fits you. Aww. And they were so involved. And another one I saw was another shoe. Maybe it was the same place. They brought in a wooden, just a piece of wood, and it was the dance floor. And kids could take different shoes and dance. And tap shoes make a big different sound than ballet slippers, than Uggs, than boots. And they played in that forever. But that was a good teacher setting up a good environment. Now, there's nothing wrong with the kitchen. But you can turn those pieces of furniture around. It can be the vet's office. It can be whatever something you like. Doctor's offices. I love, I love the, just throwing out some costumes. Costumes. They create, shop. They create a shop. story. Yeah. Um, Beauty and salons. Flower shop. Flower shop. The, the costumes are really, really valuable. But I have a four-year-old grandson who is Batman. He is. Do not call him Micah. And he will look right at the camera and go, I have to go get the bad guy. <laughs> so costumes allow children to take on another persona, to try that on, to see how that feels and to try things they wouldn't try as themselves. So dramatic play is very, very important. And if it is a kitchen, one of the things you can do is get plastic food from a culture other than the one that's predominant in your classroom. You know, if you're gonna have plastic food, maybe you should have some tamales, because that would be my favorite food to put in the kitchen. Um, so you can teach a lot of things about diversity and different people. Let's see, I think the last one that I wanted to talk about. Oh, it's outdoor play. We are losing the ability for children to play outdoors. Mm -hmm. We have become a nation, in my opinion, of scary cats. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we don't want to let children try anything. We have people hovering over their children. I will tell you a story. I might get in trouble for it. 
<laughs> when I work here, I wanted to work with the Head Start program and get the classroom here on campus so we could have, a, I don't know, a lab school and have actual children to see. And I thought I had it figured out. I had a room over by the biology so there was bathrooms and there were sinks and brought the Head Start people over who are no longer here. They've been gone for years and years and years um, to see this room and it had a little play, a little yard outside it that could have worked for a small classroom. And we're looking around and the guy's impressed and he says, well, we'll have to remove that. I said, what? He said, that root. <laughs> this is a big, beautiful tree. The root's not exposed where you could, you know, get your foot under a trip. It's just a bump in the ground. And I said, why would you do that? Well, they'll trip. Awesome. I said, they have to be able to walk on grass. <laughs> That's actually a really important skill that they have to learn. <laughs> we did not do that partnership. <laughs> But we have become so afraid that we're not, in my opinion, letting children learn critical thinking, decision-making skills. They need to learn risk. That Batman kid that I was telling you about, they lived with us for about three months when they were moving to Alaska. And I have three steps that go down into my husband's billiard room. And then a flight of stairs that goes upstairs. He was nine months old. He was going up and down crawling those three steps. So he comes to the and he looks up at the full steps. You can see his little brain going. <laughs> and he went up two steps. I'm standing right there. And it's all carpeted. And he turned around and came back down and went there. He made a decision. He's nine months old. He looked at the risk factors and said, that's too big, I'm not doing that. And came back where he was comfortable. Children have to learn to make decisions. What happens if you never, ever let a child learn about risk or decision making and they're 25 and they want to buy a car? <laughs> no clue. No clue what the process is. Um, so I'm, now don't leave here and say that I said we should allow children to take risks. We should allow the illusion of risk so that they have to make some decisions. When my children were little, I had a, a zip line in my backyard. Ended at the lake, but before was a lake. And it was actually for the tallest kid, only about six inches off the ground. It looked scary. But the kids who were seven or eight would gladly do it. The ones who were four would go over and go, I don't think so. <laughs> and they'd back off because they were assessing the risk for them. And as they got older and more confident, then they would do it. We need to allow children to have some perceived risk that they have to make a decision on. And we're not doing that. And it's frightening to me that we're not giving them the skills for everyday living. So outdoor play allows for perceived risk. It allows for exploration. The big body play, wrestling, horse play, that everybody gets so frantic about. You know these muscles right here? They're big muscles. They need to be exercised just that way. They need rough and tumble, and all the research is telling us something we already knew. Boys need it more than girls. They need that active, physical play. And we constantly say, no wrestling, no roughhousing, you can't do that. They, they need it socially and emotionally as well as physically. And I think we're harming our children by not letting them play outside. How many of you, when you were growing up, went outside and said, come home at dark? How many of you would do that for your children today? <laughs> Again, perceived risk, not real risk. If you live in a neighborhood with meth dealers, you don't let them go out by themselves. <laughs> See? Yeah. And there is a school in Switzerland that I really, really, really want to go to and take my little grandchildren to the forest school. Have you read about that one? They, we could do that? Okay. We can do that. Let's go. They take the kids, the little bitty kids, to the forest every morning. The kids have knives. The kids learn to build fires. They play. They check back in at lunchtime. They check back in when it's time to leave. They have this freedom to live and learn and explore. But when I was a little girl, horn toads were very common in Texas. I can't tell you how many of them I played with. Watch them jump. You know, ro roly polies. Yes. And, you know? Yes. And, and 
and it's just really difficult for me to see children blue. Here's the thing. We take children. When I started in this field in Texas, the earliest you could enroll a child in any kind of a child care facility that was licensed was 18 months. Do you know what age we put children in now? Six months. And they are then in an institution for the next 20 whatever years. Now, I know that somebody that owns a child care center is going to be mad at me when they hear me say that. It's not necessarily a bad thing. It just has to be done well. But regardless, we're putting them in rooms with walls till they get out of high school. And children aren't walking along. I remember going to, we went to a ladies' Bible class on Wednesday morning, my mom and I, when I was little. And after that, we went to the grocery store because it was double stamp day. Y'all don't know what that is either. I <laughs> do. <laughs> don't bring stamps. But right outside this little Safeway we went to was a pasture, and there were some horses, and there were some wild blackberry bushes. So I could pet the horses, and I could eat a few blackberries on this side of the fence. I couldn't reach over because those belonged to somebody else. You know, mother would let me do that. And I was there when she was buying groceries, and I'd watch what things cost. And I have all these learning experience just from living the day. And we don't do that. So it's expensive to go on field trips. People don't want to go on field trips because it costs a lot of money. Um, I just, I worry. And there's a lot of research out there right now that talks about how children are being disconnected from the world. They do not know where milk comes from. They really don't. Uh, they think it comes from the store. They don't know anything about cows. And if you explain it to them, they go, eh, gross. <laughs> um, they don't know about the life cycle of plants. They need to be gardening. They need to be growing things. Uh, my stepdaughter, when she was young, was convinced that eggs were dairy. <laughs> Ask me why. Tell me why. She found them next to the milk. They're in the dairy section of the store. They're not dairy. They come from chickens. It says dairy. I mean, there's, we have so much to teach them, and they only have what we allow them to have. The experiences, the hands on, hands on learning. Uh, math and manipulatives, playing with Legos and things like that. Again, that's math and science. That's what I got here. Music is very connected to math, and I'm going to quit talking. Why don't you talk? Okay. I'll sit down. Okay, if I sit down. You can sit down. Sure. <laughs> um, in my courses at Tarleton, I taught everything from birth to death, all the family issues, family relationships. One of the courses I taught was management of a licensed child care center. When you had a child care center on campus, I observed the students. My favorite thing was when they would say, that theory really works. <laughs> <laughs> you tell a child that was running in the room, come walk. One day I had a little boy, he kept running. And I called him back, it took me about five times before he, someone said, it took a long time, but it finally worked. You know, yeah. yeah, these things work. Um, Jane talked a lot about quality uh, child care centers, and that's, that's probably the most important thing uh, you can hear today. Because even if you're not going to work in a child care center, if you're going to have children that you might put in child care, it's super important. Same way with uh, the elderly. You've got to be really careful about if, if you have a family member in some facility, that it's a quality. And by the way, that's a huge career right now. It is. Yeah. Working yeah. in and working. My, my students that work uh, child and family majors, <clears throat> they they were getting prepared for all age groups and age six home. That's one that's going to be growing quickly. There's more baby boomers that are coming in there. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, quality child care and also the effects that child care has on children, but also later in life, what kind of things that, that does. What are some kinds of pre-K that you're familiar with? Where, do, where would you see a public school? What? Public school. Public schools. Church. Church. Yeah, head Starters. Head Start. Corporate. Corporate. Mm -hmm. By the way, if any of you are thinking about the child care field, Bright Horizons is a major corporate. They provide child care in companies. And it's the one way that you can make some money in the child care field. Because yeah. <laughs> you can become managers and that kind of thing. Um, any others? I think, I think you got all of them. Um, there's a Montessori. Does everybody know what Montessori is? Is that familiar to you? I see a lot of blank looks. Yeah, Montessori is, is just a, 
uh, approach that kind of what you've been talking about. It gives the children a lot of freedom in choosing what they want to do. You have a lot of opportunities for them. There's not such a set uh, agenda for the day that you make children do things that they don't want. It's a little freer. Not all children fit in that role. Well, some children need more structure. Um, in public schools, as you mentioned, you have to qualify to be able to be in those programs. It's not just like kindergarten, first grade, second grade, it's open to anyone. It's open to mostly economically disadvantaged. But I learned some new things. I, was, I did some research on how do you qualify for pre -K. Um, You have to have one of the following. Limited English is a qualifier. Uh, income, the federal poverty level, or free lunch, free breakfast, or reduced, those people can qualify. Uh, homeless, if, if, you've got, if you're dependent on the someone in the military, either active or not, or dead or alive. Um, if you've been in foster care, you can qualify for your children. Um, there's a Star of Texas Award. I didn't even know what that was. Do you no. know what that is? No. Anybody know what that is? Star of Texas Award. It's an award given to like, police, firefighters, first responders. And if you're one of those, your children qualify for I know that. Yeah, I learned every time I plan something, I learn more than I teach. Um, and you, you typically, the typical pre-K programs are four years old, but Head Start does three and four, the type of thing like that. Um, what have you heard, before we get to the, to the aspect of what the benefits of early childhood, what have you heard people say about uh, children, comparing children who did pre-K and children who didn't? You ever heard anybody comment on that? That they're ahead. Some will say that. This has a lot to do with funding. People who do not want to see pre-Ks funded with state money or federal money. It's kind of like that, except what they'll say is, those children who didn't catch up by grade three. Politics. Politics, yeah. exactly. And there, is, there are studies that show some of these children that didn't have pre-K by third grade, they have caught up intellectually, but there's a lot more to it than that. And uh, it doesn't take into account for a lot of things, such as quality. You know, a child can go to a low quality pre-K and maybe be the same or behind a child that didn't have any pre-K. So, so there is some, a little bit of truth in that, but not a, a lot. It also, people who criticize pre-K, they do not take into account the social development of the child. They don't take into account the uh, home life of the child, which many pre-K programs deal with parents, health issues, those kinds of things. So I wanted to tell you about three studies that were done. There's probably been jillions of them, but I just picked out three that have done to show not only uh, does pre-K help the child at that age, but it lasts throughout, for, for many of them throughout the ages. Uh, there was a child parent center in Chicago. This was begun in 1967. What they found out about this, with the benefits went through age 24 at that point that they looked at it. Um, and the National Health Institutes had a study, a later study, and came up with basically the same thing. So you're going to hear these from each study. I think it's really important. The importance for you, even if you're not going into a child care program, is to realize when you have children and you feel a need for pre-K, how important it is. What they found is... Or when you vote. Or when you vote, yes. You're going to vote for people. Vote. That's fine. I was telling Jean, I just, I just read recently, there's a bill in the Texas legislature to make, because pre-K is half day, to make it full day. But there's also a bill to take funds away from pre-K. So in Texas, I have a feeling which one's going to win out. Texas tends to be much more conservative and not wanting to spend money on social issues, social services. Um, Pre-K, the children who are in, again, remember the word quality. Children who are in quality pre-K, they're more likely to go to college. They're more likely to have a full-time job. This, was, this study was at age 24 when they looked at it. Uh, they're more likely to have a health insurance. They're less likely to do some other things. They're less likely to go to prison in their lifetime. They're less, less likely to suffer from depressive symptoms, <coughs> depression. Um, and this is one you need to remember. I've got a couple of references on this. If someone is trying to tell you, matter of fact, last Sunday, uh, I was talking to some friends and I was, I was gonna come do this workshop. Well, you know those benefits don't last. 
So I got to give my little lecture about <laughs> how I'd done it. And this was a person who was speaking from not wanting to spend money on it. Every, this, in this study, every dollar spent on pre-K resulted in $11 in future benefits to the participants and to society. Pretty good returns on the investment. Um, basically, the, the National Health Institute study found some of the same things, uh, but uh, one thing that was a little bit different, males and children of high school dropouts particularly benefited from pre-K. So, uh, a real difference there. Probably the most famous one, Gene helped me find this one, because I was like, okay, where can I go? And buy it? it was called the High Scope Perry Preschool Study. This was, uh, and then they followed this through age 40. Uh, what, this, what this was based on, are any of you studying any in psychology or any child development, any of the theorists of human behavior? That sound familiar? I see one yeah, yeah. I used to have students coming to my class and we'd start looking at the theories of child development. They said, we studied this in sociology. We studied it in psychology. And I said, well, maybe the third time's the trick. You'll actually remember it. <laughs> but there was, a, there was a theory by Vygotsky, which was called scaffolding. You know, the scaffolding on the side of a building. What that says is adults help prop children up at the stage they're in. And then as they develop, they keep helping them move further and further up. So that was kind of applied to pre-K. Uh, how are we gonna help these children? How are we gonna prop them up? Uh, this again was another study um, done in the 60s. Uh, and it looked at the effect of high quality childcare. That's, I mean, if you go away with anything, you'll go away with high quality, we keep mentioning. Uh, for young children living in pro poverty. So again, some of the same results, but some a little bit different. Those who were in preschool, they, they increased high school graduation. The pre-K children had a higher high school graduation rate. M many more were employed. They had higher incomes. They had more stable dwelling arrangements. They had a home. They owned more cars. It's kind of interesting. Car dealers should be all in. <laughs> okay. um, there was, again, there was a lot of, there was reduced rate of arrest, but especially in violent crimes. They had more positive family relationships. And then the, the money, this one, this one was even more significant than the other. Every dollar invested resulted in $16 return to society. So it's really a great investment. Um, once again, this, the, and I want to read you this, the authors of that study, their concluding statement, he said, or they said, high quality programs for young children living in poverty contribute to their intellectual development and social development in childhood and their school success, economic performance, and reduced commission of crime in adulthood. The thing about these studies, these are children who are already disadvantaged. They're in economically disadvantaged. Those are the ones that qualify for the free pre-K. The others, parents that can afford to pay for it, they, those children already have advantages over these children. Uh, and so this is a way, basically what they're trying to do is bring these children who are behind so that when they get into public school, they're on a level playing field with children who have higher incomes and live in better uh, issues. Um, the limitation of the study is that Again, the word high quality. These same results don't apply to pre-K if it's not a high quality. Okay. Um, if you were gonna, what would you look for? Jean told a couple of things. Yeah, that was, that was yeah. Jim. Yeah. If you were gonna look, go to a child care center and you were gonna say, this is high quality or I wouldn't leave my child here. What would be some things you would look for? When you walked in the door, what would you wanna see? I would look at the interaction among the children, smiles on their face, happy okay. children, yeah. engaged children. Are they happy, yeah. How clean it is. Sure. Now, there's a difference in clean and being active. Mm -hmm. you know, right. If you walk in a child care center and everything's put away and there's nothing on the floor, Turn away. dirt's yeah. what you're talking yeah. about. <laughs> but you want to see things out and children play with things. Not, let's get everything cleaned up instantly, you know. They do love to clean up. They have little songs. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was <laughs> the one and they were singing the clean up song. 
And the kids didn't do a single thing. The teachers didn't do all that. They all sang. Yeah. <laughs> the kids didn't do it. Yeah. I have a question. Sure. Happy about that. If a lot of the pre-K schools are underfunded, why do they turn down people who make higher, who have higher salaries? There's no tuition involved. Yeah. It, so parents don't pay. They have to qualify. In other words, if uh, those those parents can find private. The, the reason of the reason for the free pre K are the ones that couldn't afford to put them in a okay, childcare center. I, I get that. Yeah. She's saying, why couldn't the parents help fund? Yeah. And, oh, and oh, parents oh, oh. To help fund it. Yeah, I'm sure they could give something to it, but as far as funding it, that comes from state and federal funds. But what you're saying is a lot of programs mm -hmm. are the federally funded pro Head Start is what I know yeah. about. A lot of Head Start programs do add some spaces for people who pay and it does help the program, but they cannot charge anything to the kids that come in under the grant. Yeah. I get that. Yeah. But, yeah. but yes, I, I understand what you're saying and it is helpful. And as soon as you, know, you just have to find the space, <coughs> and, but a lot of Head Start programs are doing blended things like that. And ask, here's saying we have 17 classrooms that are for pay. Yeah. And that has the same quality. Do you know about public I mean, schools? I just, I just know that uh, they I just that. they I vary by school. school. Yeah. I mean, Most schools. Yeah. I was reading the thing where if a school district has one student in it that meets these qualifications, the school system has to provide it. So I have a feeling, especially the school systems that are state funded. There, there would be more less likely to this than a, than a yeah. national Yeah. Well, and budget. some of them, if they have that one or two students, some of them will work in a co-op, and three school districts will yeah. get together right. and put the program in. Right. And the other thing in Texas is that it's a half-day program. That's not true in all states. Yeah. Some states fund the full-day program. What about a uh, ratio? Okay. Yeah. Do you, well, you know about ratios about adults. Yeah, that's, that's another thing you want to look for. How many teachers per children? Yeah, it, it varies by the age of the child. It it's a long list. Uh, we have what we call minimum standards. Uh, and I emphasize the word minimum because it's the bare necessities in order to be approved as a, as a licensed child care center, either public, private, or whatever it is. Um, and those, you know, you'll be, you'll be in the child care center and here this person comes in and all of a sudden they're wanting, how many children do you have today? How many workers are in here? How many, you know, they start asking <laughs> questions. Uh, I used to tell my work, I did an after school program, uh, and I would tell them, you better know the answer to those. Don't just think you know it, yeah. you need to know it. Because there have been, you pr if you ever look at the news, there's some horror stories. You know, the, there, was, there was a woman arrested the other day in McKinney, she had been beating kids up, they had her on film, and somebody didn't, they, one time they, someone duct taped babies to the wall. Yeah. You can threaten your own kids with that. You can't yeah, actually yeah. do it. And, uh, Not allowed. They would. Well, and, and that's a good point. The the, the uh, management of children's behavior in a child care center. There's things that you can't do in a child care center that parents can do at home. Not duct tape their kids. Yeah. Well. Not duct tape. Their kids. <laughs> okay. it, you know. But uh, it's it's very it's amazing how children do things in a proper way under a restriction like that in child care, and people say, oh, that wouldn't work at home, and yes, it does. Uh, but that's for parenting, I'll talk that class too. Uh, <laughs> but the minimum standards, you know, uh, you want to see these things happening. Uh, when I was in graduate school um, at TWU, one of my classes, assign the assignment was to go visit different preschools, different types of preschool, uh, private, public, church. I went to a church there, and that church no longer exists, not because of this, but other issues, but it had plenty of issues. First thing I did, I walked in the hallway and all the workers were sitting out in the hall talking. The children were in the rooms. And that's, you, you brought up, uh, like sitting down with the children doing all that. Our church has a child care center. I walk by often, when they're on the playground, the teachers are over here on their phone, you know. And that's something you, you can't do. I go to a gym that has a little, Child care thing, but it's not it's not licensed or anything because the parents are on site. It's babysitting. But I watched the worker in there. She was on her phone. Two little girls walked out. They were wandering around the gym, which is really dangerous to heavy equipment. I, I was just kind of curious to see how long it would take her to realize it. But anyway, but anyway, this church that I went to, the everybody was sitting on the they were in the floor. Uh, I walked in. I said, Could you, I need I need to interview the director. Uh, we don't know where he is. 
Because I thought, that's a really bad place. And then later, this director was taking the little boys to the bathroom because he told the female workers, you can't take a little boy to the bathroom, I'll take them. And he was abusing them. So, you know, that, there were so many red flags. So when you go into a child care center, you want, if you're looking for one, you want to look for those things. And what is it that says quality? Uh, you know, do the workers really care about the children? Uh, legally, you can drop in anytime. You don't yeah. have to ask their permission to come and sit and watch and do those kinds of things. If they say to you, no, you can't come in. Take your the child. Children. Take your child yeah. out yeah. right then. So, I think we're at a question. I think point. so too. Maybe. One thing I do want to say that when you walk in to a center, use your gut. If you don't, if it doesn't feel right, then right. it's not right. Right. Okay, so. Yeah. I have a question about state funding. Governor Abbott has made a big deal out of the platform of early childhood. Governor Abbott and early childhood is sort of a platform that he threw out there. Uh, what do you see coming from that? Nothing or are you seeing anything? What deal? typically happens, politicians make a big deal about things but they never fund them. They'll, they'll, send, they'll send down to public schools, you must do A, B, C, and D, but they don't send any money to it. So, I wouldn't get too excited unless you see actually money's going to be put in. In Texas, it's all half-day funding for pre-K. You can have longer days. You don't get any funding for it. But in Mineral Wells, I was talking to the superintendent over there not too long ago, and they as a community have decided to offer full pre-K, full day, to everybody in the community. No restrictions. And I was very impressed by that. That takes a lot of guts and a lot of money. Money and makes life simpler. Yeah. Are there any unfunded mandates coming down that you've heard of? Or, uh, not? They're always in the. Oh, I'm trying to think what it recently was that that you know um, class sizes, that kind of thing. If if they don't always send extra money for the extra teachers, you have to hire and make those class sizes. Well, that's starting with the classic one a few years back when they decided that at least 50% of the teachers throughout the nation had to have an associate's degree, but there was no money to send the people over. Is there funding usually for the children at high special needs? Yes. yes, Head Start must have 10% of their children must have special needs, and they can qualify even without income qualification. What else? We're getting close to the We are. We are. I took two minutes. Another question or two? That's great. It's kind of saying it's crazy, like talking about funding and stuff like that, with like trying, I guess, the head start for children and stuff like that. But you go to school, but you want to fund. I was a prison guard for two years. You want to fund the PFAS and we all make mistakes to put them to go to school or for terrorists to go to school. Yeah, yeah. funding is it. Yeah, there's certain key things in our state governments, federal governments, city governments that are easy to get funded. Yeah such as arrest, weapons, all that kind of stuff. Very difficult for people to see, well, children have needs, families have needs. It, Those are the hardest things. You have to speak up. That's one yeah. thing. You have to speak yeah. up. Um, the things that get the most attention are the things that get funded. So the more attention you give, the more, the more you contact uh, political par uh, parties, your representatives, the more they're going to take a look at what we really need. And what three issues for quality care to think about is the ratio of teachers to children, what their teachers are getting paid. The reason there's such high turnover is you're asking people to come work with a degree or a certificate and they don't get enough money. Plus they're with two-year-olds all day, that's hard. Anybody ever spent the day with 22-year-olds? Because that's, isn't that state licensing right now, 20? 20 to 22. Yeah. Two-year-olds. So when I do a child care workers conference, I'd always end it by saying, People who work in the child care industry should be making what the Dallas Cowboys football players are Absolutely. They should be making what the other people. <laughs> Where does our money go? It goes to things that are not, I mean, they're fun and movie stars and all. Those are nice things, but they don't change our society like child care. In terms of grants, it seems that most federal funds, state funds, or heads for Head Start are, how many grants were out there just to fund, uh, like what for college or, you know, in different institutions? I don't know. Um, there are some. The Department of Early Childhood offers grants. Um, but you know my bias, Rhonda. I would say that all the colleges and universities ought to work closely with Head Start. The money's already out there, and it's a good partnership. So I think working otherwise, again, my personal bias, is um, 
it's just kind of creating two things that can be working together with much more benefit to both. But there are other grants out there. Are there grants but Head Start is the child care funded program for national. I didn't see anything that was, well, it may have been because of the change in, in the guard, mm -hmm. but I didn't see any new grants coming out right now. No, I haven't seen anything right now. So mm -hmm. your, your best advice is to work with Head Start to provide needed funding and funding that, students in the That's program. my opinion, and again, you know my bias. Yeah. Sorry, you've known me a long time. So, all right, all right, we gotta go. Well, that was Thank thanks. <laughs>